Hi there. So today I'd like to talk to you about general relativity. This subject was often also covered in uh, Modern Physics 1, but I feel that maybe it's time for a refresher before we launch into some of the more complex subjects of cosmology in Chapter 15. So here we go, general relativity. Um, this is the guy that we have to thank or curse, depending on your perspective, for general relativity. Albert Einstein, um, known and loved. Where would physics be without him? Probably at least a few years behind where we are now. Um, anyway, here we go. After he published his special theory of relativity in 1905, Einstein immediately began thinking about how to incorporate gravity into it. So if you remember, uh, Newton uh, came up with a law of universal gravitation where the force, uh, the gravitational force between two objects is equal to g, the gravitational constant, times the product of the two masses, we'll call them big M and little m, and then divided by the distance between those two objects squared, okay? But Newton's theory of gravity therefore includes the distance between objects. However, if you think about and remember Einstein's theory of special relativity, the distance between different objects might be measured differently by different observers traveling at different speeds. So how can a theory that's universal and thinks of everything really be considered to be thinking of everything if the values in it can change depending on who's observing the phenomenon? So this was the idea that Einstein had and led him to believe that there was more to be discovered about the theory of gravity. So he came up with a thought experiment. Einstein imagined people traveling in a rocket or an elevator. Now if the people were stationary in the rocket on Earth or if they were accelerating through space at 9.8 meters per second squared, then it would seem the same to them. Okay. If they were on Earth, of course, there would be a pull due to gravity of 9.8 meters per second squared and they would drop objects, throw objects around, and they would uh, travel in a certain way that we're used to here on Earth. Um, so you wouldn't be able to tell whether you were on Earth or in a rocket ship traveling at 9.8 meters per second squared acceleration, say, upward, if the floor is here, upward, right? Then it would seem the same to you, okay? It would seem the same to you. It would also seem the same if they were in free fall, right, or if they were in the middle of interstellar space with absolutely no gravitational pull. You would just float. Say that you're in free fall, you're a skydiver or something, and if you neglect um, uh, any other effects, let's say that you've got a ball in your hands and you're falling and you're in free fall and you release the ball, well then you and the ball are falling at the same rate, so it would seem to you that the ball was just hovering there in the middle of space, right? So you would just float. What that means, really, if you think about these two thought experiments, is that gravity and acceleration are really indistinguishable from one another. And that means that you can transform away gravity simply by switching your reference frame, okay? And that led to the principle of equivalence, and that is this. There is no experiment that can be done in a small confined space that can detect the difference between a uniform gravitational field and an equivalent uniform acceleration. Well that led Einstein to feel that uniform gravitational fields were really not so fundamental. I mean if you can transform them away then maybe it's not a fundamental thing. Well if that's the case then what remains of gravity? Well the idea is that gravity always pulls toward the center of mass of the body and this can cause asymmetries and those you can't transform away. So if you imagine here, I've got this uh, silly little diagram of this gigantic man here, a gigantic stick man, and uh, he's being pulled towards the center of the earth. Well, at the tips of his fingers, it would seem that it's pulling in a sort of diagonal line. And so what that would do is it would force his hands down to his sides, right? And then he would be pulled in. So there's an asymmetry, okay? It's not like each hand is pulled straight down. They're pulled in at an angle. Einstein argued that this was the real gravity, and it's also sometimes called tidal gravity. And it's called tidal gravity because this is the same effect that causes the ocean tides here on Earth. So the pull on the Earth from the moon and the sun stretch out um, the Earth along the line that connects them, and that causes the oceans and some of the tides. So Einstein interpreted tidal gravity as resulting from a curvature of space-time. Now this is kind of an astounding concept to wrap your head around because of course 
between us and the sun, it looks like a straight line to us. Everything looks normal. But in fact, Einstein says that the, the space-time in between us and the sun is curved. And it gets more and more curved as it gets closer to the source of the gravity, the sun. So what he says is a particle's motion, if you think of space-time as curved, just becomes the simple statement that things move in the straightest possible path in curved space-time. And that space-time becomes curved in response to matter and energy. So in other words, things fall when I drop them. If I drop my keys, for example, it's going to fall. And that's just because it's following a path in curved space-time that makes it want to travel towards the center of the Earth. And that's why it falls down. Okay? So you can repeat that experiment again and again, and it's going to travel through space following along, around, along rolling around in curved space-time. And that's why objects are attracted to one another. Now what does this mean for light? Well, if a pulse of light from a different distant star enters a small window in, say, a rocket that's traveling, right, and let's say it's accelerating at 9.8 meters per second squared through space or something like that. Well, what happens is, if light from a distant star enters a little window in the rocket, then the light continues to go straight, but the rocket would accelerate upward. And this makes the light look like it's bending downward to the astronaut that would be inside. However, according to Einstein's principle of equivalence, this is no different from a constant gravitational field. So what that would mean is that the light would be bent in the presence of a gravitational field. So this is a prediction that general relativity makes. Large gravitational fields can make the path of light curve. Okay? So the path of light can be bent if space-time is curved enough that you can notice the effect. Well, one proof of this idea is this idea of gravitational lenses. And you can see this, and it has been observed. And this is a confirmation of Einstein's theory of general relativity. So what happens in a gravitational lens is that you have very massive objects, like galaxies. And they can bend significantly light that passes by them or near them. So, for example, if you have a more distant object, and then it passes by a galaxy, then in response to this strongly curved space-time in the vicinity of the galaxy, the light's path will be bent, will curve, okay? Well, a astrophysicists can identify gravitational lenses when they look at images from distant objects. It happens when multiple images of the same object are produced. One famous example of this is Einstein's cross, okay? The image is shown here. And the light from a distant quasar in Einstein's cross is being bent around a more nearby galaxy, which is acting as a lens producing multiple images of the quasar. And this object is actually in the constellation Pegasus. And this is a Hubble Space Telescope image of it. You can see that it looks like there's four objects when really there's just the one. A more beautiful example of that might be an Einstein ring, which is pictured here. This is an uh, object LRG3-757, and it was taken with Hubble Space Telescope's Wide Field Camera 3. Um, so here you have the gravity of a luminous red galaxy, which is shown in the center of this little horseshoe-shaped object. And it's distorted gravitationally the light from a much more distant blue galaxy, which appears as a ring around the red galaxy. So more typically, the such light results, um, such light bending results in two discernible, discernible images of the galaxy. But here, the lens alignment is so precise and perfect that the background galaxy is distorting the galaxy into a horseshoe, or nearly a complete ring. And then this um, lensing effect was predicted in some detail by Einstein 70 years ago. And we can see these now, and they're called Einstein rings. So. Now another interesting um, effect and a confirmation of general relativity is that the curved space-time can actually cause the apparent speed of light to change. So even when, for example, um, it's nearby effects, like looking at um, things on the other side of our sun, even when the light seems to be traveling in a straight line to us, when the curvature and the bending of light isn't that great, if the light passes near a massive object, then it's traveling through curved space-time. So the true path is longer than the apparent path, which makes it seem as though the speed of light 
is dropping in that region. And so you might measure a speed that's a little lower than the speed of light, even if it's in a vacuum. Okay, so this is illustrated here. Let's just say that light is being emitted from some object on the other side of the sun. And it doesn't look to us as though the, uh, the light is being curved or bent very much. However, we can measure that the amount of time that it takes for the light to get to us is a little longer than it should be, given the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So this can be confirmed and measured. Here's how Einstein puts it. In the English translation of his 1920 book, Relativity, the Special and General Theory, Einstein wrote the following. According to the general theory of relativity, the law of the constancy of speed of light in a vacuum, which constitutes one of the two fundamental assumptions in the special theory of relativity, cannot claim any unlimited validity. A curvature of rays of light can only take place when the speed of propagation of light varies with the position. In other words, he's saying, well, you only get light curving in instances like refraction when the speed of light changes going from one medium to another, right? So in a vacuum, it's traveling at C, and then um, inside of a medium with an index of refraction N, then the speed of light might be measured as C over N. So the speed of light drops, and that causes the, the light to be bent. So he's saying that, in this case, gravitational lensing, or the deflection of the light, is causing because the apparent speed of light changes due to the curvature of space-time. So the speed of light changes through highly curved space-time regions with large gravitational fields, and that causes the path of light to bend. Well, you might be thinking at this point, darn it! You said the speed of light in a vacuum was constant in modern physics one. And true, <clears throat> for inertial frames, that's absolutely true. And inertial frames, remember, are what's covered by special relativity. But what is an inertial frame? An inertial frame is a frame which is not accelerating. <clears throat> so, if there's an acceleration due to gravity from a large gravitational object, and especially if the acceleration due to gravity is going to vary from place to place, as it would if you have a very massive object, right? Remember that the acceleration due to gravity de changes depending on your distance from the object then that is a non-inertial reference frame, or not inertial. And Einstein said, well, that's the only real gravity anyways when you have a tidal gravity or an asymmetry. So there you go. Now this effect is often called light retardation. And it's explained by the idea that light passing a massive object actually has a longer path through space-time because of the curvature of that nearby massive object. So even if it looks like it's traveling straight, it actually has a longer path than you think it does. Now, evidence supporting um, general relativity and this concept of light retardation came um, in the form, in one form, of a 1970 experiment by Shapiro and colleagues of some time delay measurements of radar waves that were bounced um, between Earth and off Venus and back. And what they did was they uh, measured this at what's called superior conjunction position when we're on exactly opposite sides of the sun. So what they did was they bounced these radar waves off of uh, Venus and then had them come back and measured how much time it took for the signal to uh, bounce off Venus and come back, okay? And then they plotted that as a function of um, time and position. So as we move around the sun and we reach superior conjunction, which is shown here as time t is equal to zero, superior conjunction on this plot was t is equal to zero, then you can see that the amount of time that it took for this signal um, to uh, bounce and come back was longer at superior conjunction than it was at other positions. And that's because at superior conjunction, the light had to pass right by the sun, very, very close, and that's a more strongly distorted uh, gravitational field, higher curvature of space-time when it's at superior conjunction than at any other time, and that caused the apparent delay of the signal, or the delay of the signal and the apparent slowing of the speed of light. Some more confirmation of general relativity came in the form of Mercury's orbit. This was actually one of the first things that confirmed that Einstein's theory of general relativity had merit. So what do we mean by this? Well, classical physics predicts that the planets are going to move in elliptical orbits. And the perihelion is defined as the point of closest approach. Um, and the E here is the eccentricity of the ellipse. So if you have an equation for the, um, the position it, uh, of an object in this elliptical orbit, it would be R is equal to R min times 1 plus, epsilon, uh, 1 plus E divided by 1 plus E cosine of phi. 
And so the point of perihelion is going to precess, and a lot of that precession can be explained classically. So Mercury's orbit precesses, and most of that can be explained classically. For example, classical explanations can include other planets passing near Mercury that can exert gravitational pulls on it, and that perturbs its orbit. Okay? But in 1859, it was shown that classical physics can't explain all of the precession of Mercury's orbit. There was uh, uh, about 10% or so, a little bit less, of the precession that could not be explained by classical. So it doesn't precess much, okay? but it is a cumulative effect. So after a century, it's moved a noticeable amount, like 574 arc seconds per century. And Einstein showed that general relativity predicted exactly the missing 43 arc seconds per century um, that classical physics couldn't account for. And it was one of the first confirmations of general relativity. So his prediction from general relativity said that um, you would just add on this little delta phi here in the equation, and then that delta phi he predicted as being equal to 6 pi g m divided by c squared r min times 1 plus e. Now, of course, here m is the mass of our sun. And when he solved for it, he got the 43 arc seconds um, that was missing. And you can see that, you know, almost 532 arc seconds would be gravitational tugs of the other planets. So most of it could be explained classically. However, general relativity does predict a substantial chunk, a little less than 10% or so, of the precession of the orbit of Mercury. Another idea that comes out of general relativity is gravitational time dilation. So you might remember time dilation from modern physics 1 in special relativity. Well, general relativity adds on to that, and it suggests that time passes more slowly in regions of strong gravity. This has been proven uh, with GPS satellites orbiting Earth. So due to the effects of general relativity, the clocks in each GPS satellite should get ahead of the ground-based clocks by 45 microseconds per day because they're further away from Earth and space-time isn't as strongly bent when you're further away from Earth. This actually leads to an error that you have to correct for when you use your GPS of about 10 kilometers per day. Now that's a big deal, okay? So our GPS would not work, okay, if we didn't correct using the theory of uh, general relativity. So that's a very good confirmation, to me at least, that general relativity is correct. So you can sort of estimate gravitational time dilation using this simple formula. Here, T0 is your proper time. You might remember the idea of proper time from modern physics 1 when we did special relativity. G is the gravitational constant, 6.673 times 10 to the minus 11. Here, M is the mass of the object that you're near that's really causing the time dilation. Here on Earth, it would be uh, the mass of Earth. R is the distance that the observer is from that mass of object. And C is the speed of light. So this would give you your prediction of gravitational time dilation. Now another effect that general relativity can have on light is to shift the frequency of the light or cause a redshift or a blue shift. Gravity does work on the light and that lowers its energy and this causes a shift in the frequency of the light. The equation which pr would predict that is that the shift in frequency delta F divided by the frequency F is equal to minus gm over c squared times 1 over r1 minus 1 over r2. Now here, if you're using a clock to measure the frequency, then they're placed at distances r1 and r2 from the center of a gravitational field. So if r1 is less than r2, then delta F is negative or redshifted. And this means that a source of light inside a strong gravity field have it, have it, has its wavelength redshifted when it's viewed from far away. An experimental confirmation of that is actually pretty amazing. Um, they've actually measured time dilations due to height differences of less than a meter, um, and they've been experimentally verified in the laboratory. And of course, this is only thanks to the fact that we have clocks that are so amazingly accurate. In fact, these are optical clocks, okay? Now, this was performed here on Earth. So if you're doing here on Earth, you can um, use this formula, delta F over F is equal to G times H over C squared, where H is your height, the relative height between the objects. So what they did, and this was um, uh, an experiment published in Science in 2010, is they measured the fractional difference in frequency between two optical clocks at different heights. So they measured them uh, by 
uh, about you know half a meter or so uh, differences in distance, and it caused a net relative shift in the height by about four times ten to the minus seventeen hertz. So that's pretty crazy. Um, very very accurate clocks, uh, but you can measure the gravitational uh, frequency shift. Now general relativity also predicts the existence of gravitational waves, also known as gravitons. So in other words, the information about the changes in space-time due to the motion of objects has to be propagated um, through space. That's done with a graviton. And what's a graviton? Well, you can think of it as a ripple in the fabric of space-time. So they travel at the speed of light, but remember these are not electromagnetic waves. They're ripples in the fabric of space-time. Now gravitons are very low energy, so they're hard to detect. But detectable gravity waves might occur when large masses move suddenly, like in a supernova for example, collapse of a black hole, or large scale collisions like two black holes colliding, which is what happened in 2015, leading to the announcement of the discovery of the graviton in 2016. So in general, any acceleration that's not spherically or cylindrically symmetric is going to produce a nice detectable gravitational wave. So if you think about a star going supernova, for example, that explosion will produce gravitational waves if the mass isn't ejected in a spherically symmetric way. Okay? Another example is a spinning star. A perfectly spherical star is not going to produce a gravitational wave, but if you have a lumpy star or if you have a star in orbit at about another star, then that causes asymmetries and you might detect a gravity wave from that. How do we detect gravity waves? Well, we do it through national labs like this one, LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, or LIGO for short. And that's a facility, or several, a couple of facilities, dedicated to the detection of cosmic gravitational waves and the measurement of those waves for scientific research. There's actually two facilities, widely separated installations within the United States, and they're operated in unison as a single laboratory. So these observatories are available for use by the world scientific community and it's a vital member of a network of such facilities. So the two facilities are located in Livingston, Louisiana and also in Hanford, Washington. So here's some images of those two facilities. How it works is that gravitational waves interact with matter by compressing objects in one direction while stretching them in a perpendicular direction. Remember, they're ripples in the fabric of space-time. So state-of-the-art gravitational wave detectors are L-shaped and what they do is they measure the relative lengths of the arms using interferometry, which we discussed pretty extensively in Modern Physics 1. And they look at the in interference patterns produced by the combination of two light sources. So if you remember interferometry, um, so for example the Michelson-Morley interferometer is based on kind of the same concept, except because we're trying to detect very small distortions, the arms in LIGO have to be way longer than the Michelson-Morley experiment setup. But basically it's the same idea. You pass a laser beam and it goes through a beam splitter and then it goes through the two perpendicular arms and it bounces back. Now, if you have a uh, no change, no gravitational distortion, then what will happen is those two light waves will destructively interfere with one another and you'll get no signal out. However, if there's a distortion in the fabric of space-time, well that'll occur more in one arm than the other and that'll cause an interference pattern which can be detected and announcing a, uh, announcing a gravitational wave detection. Now what's so special about LIGO's interferometer? My gosh, it's amazing. First of all, it has to be ultra high vacuum, over five miles, so that in itself is a huge deal. And remember, you're here on the surface of planet Earth, so you're going to have distortions, you're going to have uh, trucks driving by, you might have little earthquakes, you might have someone dropping a hammer on the, on the line somewhere, and that would cause vibrations in the facility. And so you have to have on these uh, arms internal and external seismic isolation systems which hold it stationary and prevent you from getting false signals and false alerts. Another way to avoid false signals and false alerts is the idea of multiple detectors. You have to have a bunch. So LIGO isn't alone. It also works with other facilities in other countries around the world. 
You need these multiple interferometers in order to confidently detect and locate sources of gravitational waves. Um, and so what happens is there's going to be a time delay between when it reaches one facility versus another facility on the other side of the world, right? As the gravitational wave passes through Earth, for example, we might have one signal that hits at a certain time here in uh, Louisiana and at another time in a facility in Australia, for example, okay? So this helps sort out candidate gravitational wave events that are caused by maybe local sources, like the hammer dropping that I talked about earlier. Okay, now, gravitational waves are really, really hard to see because they're exceedingly small. How small, you might ask. How small is it? Well, a strong gravitational wave will produce displacements on the order of 10 to the minus 18 meters. That's nothing. That's nothing. It's 1,000 times smaller than the diameter of a proton, for heaven's sake. So, waves of this strength, though, are going to be produced by massive systems undergoing large accelerations like the two orbiting black holes that merged into one that we saw in 2015. Since systems like these are rare, the sources are going to be light years away. Thank heavens, right? I wouldn't want two black holes to collide near me. But anyway, the search for gravitational waves is seeking the minute effects of some of the most energetic astrophysical systems from the depths of the universe. However, they did it. And it was amazing. On February 11, 2016, LIGO announced the first ever detection of gravitational waves, okay? So what happened was between 2010 and 2015, they were doing a series of upgrades because they hadn't seen any gravitational waves yet. And they thought, well, if we made our equipment just a smidge better, right, then we might actually be able to see. And LIGO's technology went back online in 2015. And at the time, the scientists predicted that they'd be able to detect the first gravitational waves maybe by 2016. But in fact, you can imagine how excited they must have been. Early on the morning of September 14, 2015, nearly as soon as the system was up and running, they got alarms. Loud signals came through the detectors in both Louisiana and Washington. And then the researchers spent the next several months painstakingly investigating potential environmental and instrumental disturbances in order to confirm that the gravitational waves that they detected were real. And then finally on February 11th, they made the official announcement. So what caused um, the gravitational waves that were observed? Well, scientists believe now that um, about 1.4 billion years ago, a pair of black holes were circling each other in a distant galaxy and then they finally collided. And these two black holes have masses of about 29 and 36 times more massive than the sun, respectively, and they produced a gigantic amount of energy when they collided in a fraction of a second, <clears throat> about 50 times the power of the entire visible universe is the amount of energy that it put out. And boom, we got to see it. <clears throat> so that was amazing. Way to go, science. So here's the equation for Einstein's general theory of relativity. In this course, we're only going to just kind of gently touch on some of the ideas um, of cosmology and general relativity. Um, in order to really delve into these ideas, it's really a graduate level physics course. So you have that to look forward to maybe if you're interested in that sort of thing and you're going to graduate school. But here it is. This is the Einstein field equations and they were published for the first time in 1916. So the terms are the Ricci curvature tensor shown here, the metric tensor, the G here, the scalar curvature, that's R, the cosmological constant lambda, and the stress energy tensor T here. And of course you're familiar already with G, the gravitational constant and the speed of light c. So this is a <clears throat> tensor equation that relates a, a set of symmetric 4x4 tensors and each tensor has about 10 independent components. The four Bianchi identities reduce the number of independent equations from 10 to 6, leaving the metric with four gauge fixing degrees of freedom, which corresponds to the freedom to choose a coordinate system. So there they are, the Einstein field equations. Now you might have heard of lambda, the cosmological constant. Now the cosmological constant term was originally introduced by Einstein to allow for a static universe, one that wasn't expanding or contracting. And this turned out to be unsuccessful for a couple of reasons. First of all, the static universe described by this theory was unstable. 
and observations of distant galaxies by Edwin Hubble a decade later after Einstein published his results confirmed that our universe is in fact not static. It's actually expanding. So it was abandoned with Einstein calling it the biggest blunder he ever made and for many years the cosmological constant was almost universally considered to be zero. However, in the end, Einstein got the last laugh, right? Because it ended up being that we needed that cosmological constant. And in fact, we're not in just sort of a gently uh, expanding universe. We're in an accelerating universe. And we'll talk more about that in the Math of the Big Bang lecture. However, despite Einstein's misguided motivation introducing this cosmological constant term, there's nothing inconsistent with the presence of this term in the equations, and it turns out we needed it after all. So, way to go Einstein. Even when you're wrong, you're right. I wish I could say that about myself. Anyway, sources for this lecture are included here. There's some really great websites there, so I highly encourage you to peruse them, and I'll see you next time.